Today, I'm speaking with Nathaniel Pennington. Nathaniel is the founder of the Humboldt Seed Company. The Humboldt Seed Company is a bit of an icon. It's a legendary brand in the world of cannabis. Off the top, I don't use cannabis personally, but this conversation is about so much more. We talked about unfair laws, his company's mission for activism, and the over 40,000 Americans that are currently in prison for marijuana offenses. Whether you use weed or not, I hope you enjoy this very wide-ranging conversation about the entire industry. Finally, to thank you for checking out the new show, I'm giving away a PlayStation 5. All you have to do is like and subscribe to enter. Details in the comments. Now please welcome Nathaniel Pennington to the Welcome Home Podcast. I guess the reason I brought up the social media is because it's kind of like random. Like you see some big companies don't even use it because they know that you can invest a ton into it and then Instagram can just shut your account down because you posted a picture of of a bud or a joint or something like that. And so that is incredibly random. And in California, we don't have as much restrictions for advertising, but there are some just sort of arbitrary ones. Like they just decided that we can't put billboards on interstates. So if the road continues on out of the state, then no cannabis billboard, which is bizarre because it's such a huge state <laughs> and almost every road does go elsewhere. But um, yeah, so there are these like really arbitrary restrictions to advertising. And Canada, I mean, we have this collaborative engagement with a licensed producer in Canada where we actually went and produced seeds for the Canadian uh, dispensaries and for, you know, all the, you know, I'm, we're just like learning about how all the laws in Canada work as we you know, do this, make this effort in Canada to have genetics out there for people to grow for personal use or, you know, licensed farms to use too. But, um, it is bizarre. I like, we had to completely and totally change our packaging and make it, you know, very, very plain. And, uh, in some respects I get it because, in California, there were like all these, they, they were saying there'd be all of these rules about not having stuff that was um, any marketing that could be, uh, you know, attractive to a kid or, you know, and I think that that really carries over when you have like edible candy and stuff like that. I mean, almost every state, like really one of the only things that you hear that is negative about cannabis legalization. Like you hear there's like, oh, where there's dispensaries, there are less and less deaths from opiates. Where there are, you know, is cannabis legalization, you have more revenue taxes, therefore, you know, the schools are better and all this wonderful stuff about cannabis legalization. But there's always that one story about the kid that got a hold of, the gummy bear that, you know, all of a sudden they were in the hospital and, and nobody's dying. Like it's not, but it's something that you certainly don't want to do inadvertently. And so I get it. Like we get why there are certain restrictions to advertising and, and public safety. You know, we would never want to do anything that jeopardizes public safety, but at the same time, let's just like be logical of, you know, if people want to have choices as consumers, that's at the core of, you know, our system really is that consumers make choices based on their convictions and their wants and experiences. And uh, you can't really do that when, you know, when it's almost impossible to, you know, get your story out there, you know, <laughs> like if, if you're kept from being able to say like, this is how we make, we, we grow our cannabis, you know, all organic, or we grow it, um, in, 
in a no-till, we like help the soil and we're regenerative or, you know, we use solar power to light our indoor grow or whatever it is. If you can't put that right on the package and have a picture of, of your farm, then, you know, it's like all the same kind of at the end of the day. So I don't get that. I don't get it. See, it's really interesting that you brought one of your points up because for me, I, I felt like it was incredibly unfair that an alcohol company can have Super Bowl ads. They can endorse the biggest artists and athletes on earth, but you guys couldn't run ads. And that's a tremendous competitive disadvantage for your market in 2021. But one thing you said that I didn't even think of was we're afraid of losing our Instagram account. Imagine if we build up a social platform, we could just be almost like deplatformed in that sense. Um, so that's that's very uh, disturbing, and I hope that changes. I also wanted to pivot to the laws in Canada versus where you are, because in Canada, aside from slight tax differences, we all know what the law is, and we across the entire country, we understand the laws with cannabis, aside from slight tax differences. You guys are, I guess, state to state. So is there a lot of gray areas where you have to avoid certain states? Do you have your lawyer on speed dial? Um, are you still walking on eggshells in 2021? What is the state of not having a uniform policy? Yeah, it it is really, um, we are walking on, on eggshells without a doubt, because, you know, especially as a genetics company, like it's really cut and dry. When it comes to flower, you know, the actual buds and the stuff that'll get you high, you know, the federal government has said, we are leaving these states alone that have chosen to, you know, have medical or recreational cannabis programs. They're allowed to do what they want to do within the boundaries of the state and uh, we'll leave you alone. At least that's the current iteration. Um, so, but there's no like, <laughs> like real, you know, there's a law that says, leave them alone, kind of. It's not even a law. It's actually just a budget. Um, you know, it's the Cole Memorandum, for example, said that the Justice Department can't spend money going after companies that are operating in accordance with state laws growing cannabis. And so, but there's really no law. So it what they have made very clear is that interstate commerce, so taking cannabis from one state, bringing it to another is a big no-no. And they'll still enforce anybody, whether you have a medical card in your pocket or whatever, they don't care. It's You can't take it across state lines. So yeah, like one of the biggest questions in the United States is like airports and you you'll see people like I even talked to a friend yesterday actually who landed in I can't remember I think it might have been like Wisconsin or something like that and but he's from Michigan and he actually works at a legal cannabis operation in Miss Michigan and we're going to probably do some it looks like we might be doing some breeding there with them and consulting. And that's kind of how we start our, you know, genetic work in different states in the country is, is by partnering up with existing operations. And so in any case, on his way to visit and to like learn and talk, he got, he was just like literally standing by the gate. You know, he, he had a, he had to switch planes and they're like, dogs surround him and, and they're <laughs> checking him out and he got you know like taken aside and completely and totally searched and they were like you clearly came from somewhere where you know cannabis was all over and he's like just was admitted he's like yeah i work at a cannabis farm we had like there is cannabis flower all over my my clothes probably because that's what i was doing maybe even earlier that day. I don't know, but it is, it's wild. So that's the U S it's kind of clear what you can and cannot do, but 
Now we kind of brought in like hemp legalization in 2018 in the farm bill. And that even is still kind of working itself out. Like the definition of what hemp is so far, it's been kind of any cannabis that is below 0.3% with THC, but there have been some shifts, some, a little bit of like loosening up about those hard and fast kind of arbitrary numbers that have been, you know, it's been really hard for people that hemp farmers because this is a plant and it's growing in a field that no matter what you do, there's going to be different weather even that could, you know, really affect whether your plants get above 0.3% or stay below it. So that number has been confusing and arbitrary for a lot of people that are in the the hemp space. And, uh, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, like it's not a harmful plant. Like I get the, having the government want to have some, you know, get tax dividends or whatever. Um, I get that. And I'm not like opposed to that because I know, you know, that, that, you know, I use the roads. I drive around the roads that the government pays for, everything like that. So it's it's important that we we contribute. But um, you know, I I don't know. I I would like to see cannabis treated more, just like tomatoes. <laughs> Grow them in your backyard if you want. <laughs> Dude, I'm I'm a Canadian. I'm 26. The reason I called you, I, I'm probably going to get a couple dislikes off this right now. I am not a cannabis smoker regularly myself. The reason I was so interested in having this conversation is because I'm tremendously uncomfortable that it's 2021. Cannabis companies are being treated this way. People are in jail for cannabis sales. Um, so beyond uh, my use of something, it's it blows my mind that we're in 2021 and you could look around and people are treating this plant the way they do. Maybe it's because I'm young. Maybe it's because I was born in Canada and I saw the legalization conversation early. But it, it feels like we're going to look back and we're going to be on the wrong side of history. I wanted to actually on that note ask you, in 50 years, a prediction, how are we going to look back on the laws and the attitude of weed in 50 years? <laughs> That's a good question. You're probably going to be think, embarrassed, I could assume. <laughs> definitely. I, I definitely think so because, you know, I mean, I've been smoking cannabis since I don't even want to say how young I was, but um, pretty, like, maybe too young even. But that said, like, I was going to – would. kids are rebellious, you know, like, we're going to try things and and cannabis was absolutely – by far and wide the most the least dangerous and in in a lot of ways kind of the most fun thing of my childhood and so you know society doesn't need to be like robbing kids from fun i don't know that that's another topic but yes absolutely there's it's not a harmful substance it's so much less dangerous than alcohol for example i mean Alcohol ruins people's lives. Does cannabis like ruin people's lives? I don't personally feel like I could ever find a a situation where cannabis really destroyed anybody's life, except for when they were being arrested for having too much cannabis. And then yes, like exactly that that really messed their life up. But had it been, you know, it legal, no, it would not destroy anybody's life. And I just, I can't think of a situation where it did, but with so many other substances that are readily available, um, be they legal like alcohol and tobacco and, and those kinds of things, or, you know, opioids, whatever prescription stuff that you can get your hands on. 
everything seems more dangerous than cannabis. So yeah, I think you're totally right. I think in 50 years, we're going to be like, what the hell were, you know, why was that propaganda campaign that started in like the 20s and 1930s in the United States? Like, why did that just take over the world? And for a hundred years, why was this plant so taboo? And it'll just, it'll be kind of, you know, funny, but if you think about it, all the harm that that's done to people and especially like, you know, you look at like the statistics and it's like people of color and poor people and, you know, just certain segments of population have really suffered from this bullshit. And yes, so absolutely. I think it is going to be embarrassing. Even the early propaganda was incredibly racist and I could be wrong thinking 50 years in ahead, but it it looks like we're probably going to be pretty embarrassed about our thoughts on alcohol versus marijuana um, when yeah. the dust settles. But, you know, you mentioned your company's initiatives and social justice, and you're clearly been in the game for a long time. I have an article from 2020 that says that over 40,000 Americans are incarcerated today because of a marijuana offense. Is this something that you talk about? Is there some initiatives you've been involved with? Um, Because that's a a, a glaring issue as well, that there are 40,000 people, as you and I are having this conversation, in a prison because of weed. Yeah, yeah. Um, Well, we support a couple different groups. You know, there's one that's right now really kind of capturing a bunch of headlines called The Last Prisoner Project. And we support those guys, but we also support a lot of like, you know, the really classic um, normal, which is the national organization for the reform of marijuana laws. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if Canada has much of a normal, but it, I mean, it's, this is an international organization that has really, it's super rootsy when it comes to cannabis, uh, you know, trying to, just do away with these kind of archaic rules about cannabis. So normal is something that we've, we've been supportive of for years and they've made campaigns uh, to try to reverse sentences, try to appeal sentences of individuals that have clearly been locked up for just, you know, dumb, dumb reasons. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, the the guy Eddie Lepp is is a guy that did time. I mean, a lot of actually, you know, there's quite a few even Humboldt farmers that are just amazing stories. Um, uh, trying to think, but anyway, you know, people that have done time and then turn around and now are actually you know, have a burgeoning cannabis company that's legal and we can't give them that time back. But I think that that's where like supporting original cannabis culture comes in is, you know, as consumers out there, people, you know, I think it's important to just try to keep this culture alive because, you know, and sometimes even that's like, you know, Jay-Z is like super in the cannabis game right now. And and his brand is uh, trying to, you know, supporting like the Last Prisoner Project, doing things that I think give back to the community that was here. But um, I think nothing does that more than just simply being like, all right, let's, you know, do business together. Let's actually create, you know, a real economy around this thing that was, you know, would put you in prison for, you know, 20 to life 10 years ago. And so, I mean, if you look at that though, it's, it is, it's kind of amazing, like how much we've accomplished and how far we've come. And, and I, I'd be remiss to not mention, uh, Dennis Perone, who was the activist and the primary author of Proposition 215, which was the original 
medical cannabis uh, like voter initiative. So it just came from the people of California, really. He got that through, you know, the 1996 vote, got it on the ballot. He was a, um, you know, part of the gay community in, in San Francisco that at the time was really suffering from like not good health, like not enough health care, not enough access to health care. And, you know, we had like a lot of, of cancer because we were still coming out of a time where, you know, known carcinogens were just, you know, part of everyday life. And uh, also the AIDS crisis was happening in a major way, especially in the, the that community of San Francisco. And so he was seeing like all of this pain and suffering and he identified cannabis as this way for people to not just, you know, not hate their life. I mean, you're going through chemo and you're sick and you have pain in every part of your body. Why in the world would you not be able to consume this herb that grows out in your backyard if it makes you sleep and if it makes you eat and if it just helps you get through your day while you're treating this cancer that's eating your body. That concept worked, like his argument there worked and it convinced, you know, California, one of the United States most, you know, biggest and most populous places to vote that people should be able to ease their suffering. And that turned into, uh, you know, a, that was a tipping point in and of itself because enough people had it and said, there's nothing wrong with this. You know, like it's really, um, just seems to be helping these people in these communities and, you know, all of these things that have been said for years, like, you know, reefer madness and all the propaganda, just, it, it, it was case in point, you know, like proof right here. It's not killing people. It's not turning society into, you know, a bunch of pot crazed, you know, people are just have le leading better lives and being able to be just a little bit more free. That's why, uh, you know, conversations like this seem really meaningful because you guys can't advertise and in Canada, the packaging is all uniform. There's no branding element, but being able to share these stories, talk about the history. I feel like the average cannabis user, if they, if they knew the history and some of the pain people have gone through so they could enjoy this, they would be attracted to brands with a rich history versus, uh, you know, the, the, the flashy stuff we see with the numbers attached in the VCs and, and Silicon Valley conversations. But on that note, I wanted to wrap up. This has been really fun, by the way. But I wanted to wrap yeah. up with a collaboration I read on your website with a local tribe. Can you talk a little bit about that and uh, what was working with them like? Well, so I didn't really talk about this, but our company in general has had a lot of uh, – you know, for the time when we were like breeding cannabis, but we couldn't really be uh, a company, so to speak, as much like we, we we were, but we weren't screaming from the mountaintops like, oh, we're breeding cannabis and, and we have cannabis seeds in dispensaries. Because if you did that, you probably were going to get in trouble. And so for many years, we just kind of did what we were doing. We had our seeds in dispensaries all over California, but it was just like, you didn't promote. Um, and it's, so it's still kind of that way. That's like a little bit of what our conversation has been about. So that's ironic, but uh, we're used to it. And when, w during that time, um, something that I've always been passionate about and a lot of people that have been with us for a long time have been really passionate about is like the rivers California is a place that like rivers kind of 
are big and dominate the geography, so, so to speak. Salmon is a thing that has been a driver for the economy. And then, of course, like tribes, California being one of the last places to be inundated with colonialism, um, tribes are still really, really uh, rich culturally, and there's still a lot of intact people that, you know, and it's awesome. Like, we're so honored. I mean, that was one of the things that when I came to California, I was just like, holy shit, this still exists. Like, yes, we haven't just whitewashed this whole landscape. And I know that, you know, like Canada, you guys still have, I think it's like First Nations. And I always thought that was yep. kind of a really cool way that you chose to to say that because, you know, that kind of just gives the, the, the rightful, you know, terminology because they, they, for better or for, I mean, they were nations. And so anyway, Humboldt, we have a number of different tribes here and those are the people that know how to treat this land the best. They've been here the longest. They have so much to teach us as current, you know, occupants of this place, co-occupants now. We don't really feel like there's this, you know, we don't want you here thing. So it's great because we just treat each other like humans. And that's been amazing. So one of the things that we worked with the tribe to do, um, not really as Humboldt Seed Company, but as nonprofit people that work, you know, I worked as the coordinator of a nonprofit for nine years. And we did, an, we were fighting for the health of a local river called the Klamath River. And in particular, the salmon runs that have, you know, come up the river since time immemorial. And of course, the tribes that have been here for time immemorial have always harvested the salmon and it's been their tradition. And so fighting together for the health of that river and for like the rights of the salmon and, and the rights of our ecosystems um, when an opportunity arose to do some business together and breed um, hemp seeds, which are federally legal, the tribe kind of jumped on that. And so, you know, I can't say that it's been a huge economic boon because we kind of saw the hemp market crash in the United States, but it's been great. And we're still working together on the project. We still have a business uh, together that we, we do and, and we're breeding um, great hemp seeds. So. Well, I really appreciate you taking my call today. I feel like whether you smoke weed or not, you're going to take away something from this and you're going to share this story uh, with one of your friends. So thanks again, man. I really appreciate it. To celebrate the new podcast, I'm giving away a PlayStation 5 to one of my viewers. All you have to do is like and subscribe. That's it. Full details in the comments. Good luck.